Good morning, my name is Keith McKinnon. I'm a Masonic collector and also a past curator of a Masonic collection uh, for 30 years. And sitting beside me today is... I'm uh, John Wilder, I'm the historian and archivist at Aleppo Shrine. Uh, today's quick segment is going to be about uh, certain rules of thumb about collecting. Now, it doesn't matter whether or not you are collecting, say, Masonic memorabilia, matchbox cars, uh, glass bottles, or military uh, memorabilia, there are certain rules of thumb that one should follow. First of all, not everything Masonic is worth a million bucks. Not everything rare or hard to find is worth some money. And also, every, anything old is not always worth something. Do you agree, John? Uh, absolutely. Uh, John is the curator of Aleppo, and he deals with a lot of the old memorabilia there uh, for the shrine. Um, certain other rules of thumb. Number one, rules of thumb can be thrown out the window because if an individual who is a collector wishes to purchase a specific item, he or she will pay anything to have that piece in the collection. So the rules of thumb sometimes are thrown right out the window because of that. Absolutely, it, it, it's all about, um, it's sort of almost a perceived value. Um, and and that, get, that gets into market, so who, who, who's, who's the market for? Um, and I think a lot with our, uh, the Masonic fraternity and the larger fraternal world, there are a lot, more, a lot less members than there used to be uh, so a lot more of this is out to the public, right. which makes an interesting back and forth. Uh, so a couple of the rules of thumb, once you fall. First of all, uh, it's always about condition. Condition, condition, condition. No matter, again, what field you are collecting. Uh, now with this piece here, you see that it's a chip gone. Does that take away from the value of the piece? Yes and no. Um, if you're going to become a collector, buyer, or seller, you really have to know what you are dealing with and do some research. Uh, a couple other rules of thumb. Uh, with value of the piece or the historical value of the piece, um, who is it made by? Uh, that does play uh, a huge amount of value on the item. Um, such as uh, also what is the material or where the item came from will play uh, a value or historical value on the piece. Such as a gavel from, made from a piece of the wood of the USS Constitution is worth a lot more money and more historical than just a plain wooden gavel. Uh, also documentation. If you have a piece, a gavel from the USS Constitution, you have to have documentation that goes with the piece. Uh, the same with who was it made for. Also plays a part in its value. Uh, hopefully, the piece that it was made for the person increases the value and doesn't decrease the value. Um, what was the item made for or how it was used? That could have some play on it. Um, and basically for me coming back to step number one is always condition. I don't know about you, John. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, it, it, for me, condition uh, goes hand in hand with, with rarity of the item. Um, you know, these, these are nice pieces here. Um, they're well made. So the chip on the back isn't going to bother me. Um, talking specifically with what I deal with a lot at the shrine, you know, I get a fez in that's moth-eaten. Well, if the fez was from the 1800s and there's only 10 of them in existence, yeah, I still want it. If it's from the 70s and there were, you know, a million of them made, well, I can afford to get rid of that. So it, 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 it's, it's definitely an important factor, um, but it's also in the large, looking at the piece as a whole uh, and taking all of that into account. Um, you know, you bring up some great points with, um, you know, growing up in Boston and having a naval heritage in my background, we have some items made from Word of the Constitution. Um, you know, we, we don't have documentation on it. 
uh, but it's passed down in our family. Um, but like a, a Masonic gavel, well now all of a sudden you have uh, cross markets. Mm -hmm. So you have the Masonic collector, you have the military patriotic collector, and that drives the price up. Um, you see a lot of that, we come across that with the shrine and certain Masonic stuff when they had their big conven conventions and you had local companies sponsoring souvenirs, you've got fraternal and advertising going hand in hand, drives the price up. Um, so it's definitely a very interesting thing that we come across uh, within the fraternal world. Right? And John Pick also touched on two very good, uh, important parts, uh, points. Uh, rarity or hard to find items. That will also increase the value of the piece. But again, you have to do research on the item. Is the item a rare piece? 90% of the time when you see something on eBay or you see something for sale at auction, there's always going to be another piece down the road. Uh, so research has to be done on that. Also, uh, you pointed out about a piece transfer uh, going across the threshold from one category to the next. Uh, so now you have two different categories or possibly three that you're playing with. And later today, I will have a segment on how one piece transverses from one to the next to the next, uh, combining three different categories into one. I, I think uh, one thing you, you've touched on a number of times is research. Uh, and I think that's very important because there's a number of pieces that, that we see often that people say, oh, I found this Masonic item. And you say, well, it's not Masonic. Uh, you know, specifically in the fraternal world, we have to realize that in the 1800s, there were hundreds of fraternal organizations out there. And as much as we, uh, as members, now hold our symbols and our symbolism uh, sacred, often we don't have a copyright on the square and compasses. Um, there's a number of organizations out there that, have, that use the square and compasses. We see a lot from the um, Junior Order of United American Workmen, um, or mechanics or something. That was a, a labor union, and one of their main symbols was the square and compasses with the arm and hammer. Um, the biggest comparative organization to the Freemasons was the Oddfellows. Well, the Oddfellows had an organization that was almost identical to the Shrine. They had one that was similar to the Knights Templar Commandery, uh, and a lot of the regalia is very, very similar. So it's. It's definitely worth doing your research. Uh, I had a, a, a brother contact me recently saying, oh, I just bought this you know, solid gold watch fob at an at a, uh, antique store because it was Masonic. I'm so happy to have it. I had to break it to him. I said, no, it's, it's actually Oddfellows. It's not Masonic. Um, so he was going to try to return it. But, uh, so it, it's, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely worth putting in the time to do your research. Just just so you're aware for your own collection or especially if you're trying to resell it because uh, of course you don't want to be accused of trying to uh, you know throw the rug you know pull the rug over somebody's eyes uh, you know so yes research is basically goes hand in hand if you're going to be a collector seller or buyer um, if you're going to be a buyer you need to know what's on the market uh, there are reproductions out there uh, not many but there are uh, you do need to know what the value is going to be but again if you really want it for your collection then you're going to spend a thousand dollars for the piece for your collection and you could end up in a bidding war with somebody else that also wants it um, so the best advice I can give to anybody who wants to be a collector seller buyers is do some research there is today with the internet a tremendous amount of research availability to you 30 years ago when I was curator when I first started off there was very little uh, mostly was through magazines, uh, newspapers, uh, books. Uh, there are a tremendous amount of good books out there on the market still. Um, there's a lot on the internet. There are auctions, eBay, uh, Etsy, uh, a number of those sites that uh, you can watch an item, see what it sells for. Auction sites where you could actually look at what the price sold for. Um, and I would I suggest that you start some sort of a, a data record um, on, on Masonic memorabilia that you want to collect or you're interested in collecting. Uh, could be a Royal Arch Chapter penny or a Fez or Warden's Columns. Um, 
there's a tremendous amount out there. So the best advice I can do give today is, is do the research. Get to know the items, what they're worth, what they're not. Um, also, also want to point out that like any other antique, um, Masonic memorabilia has its highs and has its lows, uh, just like any other antique. Years ago, Asian uh, or Chinese uh, items were in huge demand and prices were skyrocketing. Um, some still are, but in most cases, that has dropped. It's just the surge of the market, and Masonic memorabilia will fall into that. Right now, I see a high on some of these pieces. Uh, because of the younger members that want to collect the stuff and is driving the prices higher. Uh, but there is so much out there. Uh, you really need to do the research. And as John mentioned, you got to make sure that it's not an Oddfellows piece or an Orange Men's piece or a Red Men's piece. There are other fraternity organizations that use the exact same symbolism as ours. And some regalia companies sold the same item to them, so they could be used in a Masonic Lodge or in a non fellows Lodge. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. You know, the world is a so much smaller place. There's so many resources out there. Uh, don't be afraid to try to contact the organizations. I will say a lot of time, the organization is not going to be interested in purchasing the item because we have closets full of stuff, uh, but we are willing to help you find it, give you information about the historical aspect. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very straightforward when people contact me saying, listen, I have 30 of these, I, you know, I don't buy stuff, but here's the information uh, you touched upon, the research. My digital archive is probably 10 times larger than my physical archive. Um, so it, it's, I absolutely agree. It's, it's, um, it's putting the time out there. There's uh, some of the companies themselves have, uh, have archives, the um, uh, Demoulin, uh, company, which was huge, has a museum out in uh, Indiana or Illinois, I believe. There are great resources. Um, the uh, Knights of Pythias have a uh, have a museum, the uh, Rathmo Museum. Um, they, which they have a lot of great resources for different fraternal organizations. So um, there's so much information out there, and it's all at our fingertips, uh, which, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's about it that I have to bring today about this topic, uh, John. Uh, I think you covered uh, all the all the high points. So, uh, so I want to thank John very much for coming here today. Uh, again, he's the curator of the Aleppo Shrine Museum in Wilmington, Massachusetts, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.